Hello and welcome to our next reflection on the writings of St. Francis of Assisi. Today we look at the later rule that has been approved uh, by Pope Honorius III on the 29th of November 1223. Ever since that time, since it became a papal document, this is the rule according to which the friars wish to live by. And so for us as Capuchins, this is also our rule of life. Uh, as you will see in comparison to the earlier rule, it is a lot shorter. It contains only 12 short chapters. Uh, the language used is also quite different. Uh, and hence also the conviction that probably a lot of other people were involved in writing and helping to compose this rule, to make it more succinct. Uh, at the same time, it is also true that this rule is faithful to the gospel vision of St. Francis himself. So what does this rule tell us? The first chapter is a summary of our way of life. The rule and life of the Lesser Brothers is this, to observe the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ by living in obedience without anything of one's own and in chastity. It also reminds us that Francis pledges obedience, reverence to the Pope and his successors. The brothers are bound to do the same and to show obedience to Francis and his successors. The successor of St. Francis for us in our congregation, in our order, is a general minister. And so we are called to live in obedience. The second chapter talk to, talks about those who wish to adopt this life and how they should be received. Just as in the earlier rule, it talks about letting go of things, selling the goods that you have leaving them behind, giving what you can to the poor, uh, to make sure that the brother coming to join you uh, is true to the Catholic faith and the sacraments of the Church. Remember those various exhortations. Make sure you are Catholics. It talks about some details with regards to the various bits of clothing, the tunic, uh, whatever the friars, the new friars, are to receive from the order. Uh, a requirement, let all the brothers wear poor clothes, and they may mend them with pieces of sackcloth, or rather material with the blessing of God. I admonish and exhort them not to look down upon or judge those whom they see dressed in soft and fine clothes, and enjoying the choicest food and drink, but rather let everyone judge and look down upon himself. A great invitation, a great challenge. Look at yourself. Don't worry too much about people around you. Uh, be aware of how much you have got to change, how much you have got to learn, how much you have to grow. And there is enough material for you there uh, to lead you for the rest of your life. Leave others alone. Don't judge them. The third chapter talks about the divine office, fasting, and how the brothers are to go about in the world. And so again, join in the prayer of the church. Say the breviary, pray the psalms. Those who do not know how to read, say the Our Fathers. And St. Francis gives a certain amount uh, for each of the hours of the day. Fast like before from all saints to the Lord's nativity. Uh, may those be blessed by the Lord who fast voluntarily during that holy Lent that begins at the Epiphany and lasts during the 40 days which our Lord consecrated by his own fast. Also fast during Lent until the time of the Resurrection. Remember Fridays to honour the Passion of the Lord. During the time of obvious need, however, the friars are not bound to fast. 
I counsel, admonish, and exhort my brothers not to quarrel or argue or judge others when they go about in the world. Essentially, don't get involved in all sorts of disputes. But let them be meek, peaceful, modest, gentle, and humble, speaking courteously to everyone as is becoming. Into whatever house they enter, let them first say, Peace be to this house. According to the Holy Gospel, let them eat whatever food is set before them. So there is a certain way of being that Francis recommends for his friars here. And that requires a lot of maturity, a lot of integration within our daily life. To be able not to react to people, but learn to respond. Chapter, the fourth chapter talks about brothers never to receive money. Uh, remember how Francis viewed money. They should have no more value than stones. Again, you can be rewarded for your service, you can be rewarded for your work, but don't get entangled with money. Don't let that rule you. And it's important for us as we live this rule, as, as we are inspired by this rule, uh, to think of other things that can have the same effect on us. Don't just limit ourselves to money and finances. The fifth chapter talks about the manner of working. Those who can should do so, and should do so faithfully and devotedly, to avoid idleness. But, on the other side, if you work, make sure you don't extinguish the spirit of holy prayer and devotion, to which all temporal things must contribute. Remember, St. Francis left us this great balance between his life of contemplation and his active life, the life of ministry and service. Chapter the Sixth let the brothers not make anything their own, begging alms and the sick brothers. There should be nothing that you feel is yours. That's essentially the message. Don't make anything your own, neither house, nor place, nor anything at all. As pilgrims and strangers in this world, serving the Lord in poverty and humility, let them go seeking alms with confidence. And they should not be ashamed, because our Lord made himself poor in this world. St. Francis tells us to live poverty, uh, to look at Christ, poor and crucified, and to imitate him. This is the sublime height of most exalted poverty, which has made you, my most beloved brothers, heirs and kings of the kingdom of heaven, poor in temporal things, but exalted in virtue. Let this be your portion, which leads you, which leads into the land of the living. Give yourselves totally to this. Again, to reflect on what does it mean for me to lead a life of poverty. What does this choice of life entail for me? How am I to live this in practice? What does this actually mean? Whenever the brothers meet, let them show that they are members of the same family. Make known your needs to one another. When any brother falls sick, the other brothers must serve him as they would wish to be served themselves. The seventh chapter talks about the penance to be imposed on the brothers who sin. Again, we talked about the brother having a recourse to his minister uh, to talk about his difficulty having recourse to a priest to seek absolution, to go to confession. And the brothers must be careful not to be angry or disturbed at the sin of another. 
for anger and disturbance impede charity in themselves and in others. St. Francis is very much aware of what happens to us, of the instinctive reactions that we can face and encounter, and he is warning us, pay attention to those, don't give in. You must become different. He is showing us what our humanity is capable of uh, if we live it to the full, if we live it in union with Christ. So acknowledge the truth of somebody's sin. Appreciate it, don't diminish it, but don't get disturbed or angry because of it. The eighth chapter talks about the election of the general minister of the fraternity and the chapter of Pentecost. One of the brothers has to be the servant of the whole fraternity. And that's why the brothers would come together at a chapter to select one from among themselves to be that servant. That servant is elected every three years. Uh, for us in the order, the general minister is elected once every six years. The provincial minister, those who are in charge of a smaller uh, geographical location of the friars, are elected once every three years. And so the brothers continue this custom of coming together to pray, to discuss, to discern, uh, and to make those decisions. Who do we think will be best suited to serve the needs of the fraternity? Chapter 9 talks about the preachers. Again, they have to be approved, they have to be examined, uh, it's not a ministry that anyone would take upon themselves. And St. Francis admonishes those who preach, May your language be well considered and chaste, for the benefit and edification of the people, announcing to them vices and virtues, punishment and glory, with brevity, because our Lord, when on earth, kept his word brief. Keep it short. Don't go for too long. I'm sure many of you listening uh, would resonate with these sentiments of St. Francis. Chapter 10, the admonition and correction of the brothers. The ministers, those who serve, need to admonish and correct, but to do it with humility and with charity, not commanding anything that is impossible or against the, so the soul of the friar or the rule. The brothers who are not ministers need to remember that we have given our wills away. We have come to do the will of the Father, not to do our own wills. Wherever we feel that we cannot live according to the rule, talk to the minister. Explain what the difficulties are. And St. Francis admonishes his friars, Beware of all pride, vain glory, envy and greed, of care and solicitude for the things of this world, of detraction and murmuring. Again, why are these things enumerated, as we mentioned earlier? Because of experience. These are probably the most common things that we as human beings tend to do. Uh, in our relationships. These are the ways in which we fall, in which we get things wrong. Those who are not learned, don't be too eager to acquire that knowledge. Pray. The Spirit and His presence is what is most important. The eleventh chapter, the brothers may not enter the monasteries of nuns. Again, this is to preserve any suspicious dealings or conversations with women, and also the safety and preservations of the monasteries of nuns. Only those can enter who have been given the special permission granted by the Apostolic See. 
chapter the 12th, the last chapter, those who go about among the Saracens and to other non-believers. Uh, the ministers need to see whether the friar is fit to become a missionary. Is he suited? Uh, it is a discernment that is both done by the friar himself, but also by the minister. Essentially, St. Francis summarizes in these 12 short chapters the rule. And what we have in the order is the constitutions. And so the Capuchin order would have its own set of constitutions, which would help us understand and apply these 12 chapters to our current way of life, to our current situation in the world at this given moment. And so the rule has stayed the same. The rule hasn't changed at all ever since 1223, but our constitutions do change. Because as you imagine, it is a question of applying this rule of life to our situation today. It's about discerning, interpreting. What can I take from this? What applies to me? What message can I take on board? And I don't have to be a religious I don't have to live the evangelical vows to gain some wisdom from the writings or from this later rule. So let's pray today through the intercession of St. Francis for all those who read this rule in full, for all those who will be inspired and touched by this rule, that we may all learn to follow the gospel more closely. God bless.